Marianne Ruschenbarger uh, is actually a colleague of mine. She's the program director for the Monarch Sister Schools program. And the reason why I thought this would be of interest to our club is because she's spoken to so many other Rotary clubs. I, I've lost count. It's well over a dozen. Um, she is a member of ESRAG, which is the Rotary Action Group for um, Environmental Sustainability. Um, she's worked closely with Chris Puddock, who spoke with us uh, uh, a couple months back. Um, Marianne was born in Canada, um, went to school locally um, in Maryland, uh, lived in England and Switzerland. Uh, she's, in that sense, she's quite international. Got an MBA from Loyola University in Baltimore. Uh, she's lived in Baltimore for some time now, uh, since the 1980s, I think. And uh, she was actually president of the Baltimore City Rotary Club. And I attended uh, her club at the time that she was president. So uh, we've had a long time connection. Um, she's presently a member of the Baltimore Sunset Club. Um, she's done some global grants, very much uh, very active Rotarian, uh, including a major one for uh, a water project, water treatment project in Honduras. Again. I'm going to give you a good education today about monarchs, and I've learned everything I know from either William Dent or Chris Puddock. And like I, like William said, uh, he has been to my Rotary Club meetings, and I've been to one of yours at the University Club. And William started this wonderful program about 12 years ago. And in 2009, I went on the district conference, which was a cruise at the time. And uh, this was Betty's year. And there I met, um, I'm not sure if William was there, but I know I met Chris Puttick and yeah, he was Chris talking was. about the Monarch Butterfly Program. And I had uh, uh, worked with a parent at my kid's school and we found milkweed growing there naturally. And we were talking about starting a green school. So, or, you know, getting our school to become a green school. So uh, I went back to that parent and said, I learned all about you know, Rotary has a monarch butterfly program. We'll pay to pay to uh, put the garden in. Do we want to do this? And she said, absolutely. So I planted the first garden in 2009 in Baltimore. And then every year as a volunteer, I planted another garden. Uh, and then last November, I asked William if I could come on board full time and started planting gardens uh, full time and focusing on this full time. So we're a very small nonprofit. Uh, our executive director is still William Dent. Um, I am the program director and we have one employee who is uh, um, a school facilitator for us and her name is Molly. Um, in addition to planting gardens, we have now added little libraries to our gardens. So if you look down here in the lower left, this is a Rotarian George Brown from the Towson Town Rotary Club. And he's been helping us build the little libraries and we build them and paint them. And then we farm them out to artists. And you can see a couple of the designs um, that the artists have come up with. So every little library is gonna be completely different. And this is the first one that we installed and it's actually at uh, Moravia Park Elementary School. And if you look in the December Rotary Magazine on page 10, you'll see a picture of one of our Rotarians and two volunteers in a mulch pile. And that was when we were building this garden this summer. Uh, somehow we got that into Rotary International's magazine. So that was pretty exciting. So here is the male and the female monarch. You can see the female monarch has a little bit thicker black lines on its body. And the male monarch has these two dots, which um, is the only way I can really tell them apart. I can't really tell the thicker black lines when I, I don't see the male next to the female. So the way it all begins is a female monarch will lay hundreds of eggs, usually one egg on each milkweed plant, 
not on each leaf, but on one plant at a time. And this is the egg. Out of this egg will emerge a caterpillar within four or five days. And that caterpillar will eat milkweed and nothing else until it's large enough to form a chrysalis, which is this green uh, shape here. It's not a cocoon. Only moths will create cocoons and butterflies create chrysalises. And then seven to 14 days later, you have a beautiful monarch adult flying butterfly. So here's the process again, starts with an egg being laid underneath the leaf. Out comes a little, a little caterpillar, which turns around and eats its eggshell. And it goes through five stages or five instars. And the way I tell these apart is by the antenna in the front. So you begin with no antenna, then they get little nubs and then little tiny sticks. And then the antennas are long enough that they protrude past the head. And when they're ready to form a chrysalis, the antenna is long enough that it can actually touch the ground in front of it. So this is a full size caterpillar on a penny to give you an idea of a full size. Um, and at this point, the caterpillar hangs upside down. It forms a little silk uh, string here to attach itself to a leaf or a stick or a fence. It hangs in a J form, and then it starts wiggling around as this chrysalis forms around, or it kind of um, eliminates this skin that's here because the caterpillar does molt five times and outgrows its skin. So it's doing the same thing here with the chrysalis. And at the very top is the skin that's gonna just fall on the ground. Then the chrysalis will stay in this shape for about seven to 14 days. When, it, when you can see the butterfly wings inside, it's ready to emerge. The chrysalis kind of breaks open and the butterfly flops out and it needs to hang on to the chrysalis and just rest for a little while as the blood pumps through the wings and fills the wings out so it's capable of flying. And here's a bigger picture of what the chrysalis looks like. It's actually a beautiful, um, a, a beautiful part of nature. It's a very lime green with a gold band going around it and little gold specks on the bottom part. So again, you see the metamorphosis, the butterfly into the, chrys the caterpillar into the chrysalis and the butterfly emerging until it's ready to actually fly and migrate. Monarch Watch is out of the University of Kansas and they do accounting every year in California and also in Mexico. That's the only time the monarchs are still is in the fall when they've migrated to their winter habitat. And so they count the number of hectares uh, or surrounding uh, the trees where all of the monarchs go in the winter time. You can see that our numbers have been declining and we've actually declined between 80 and 90% just in the last 20 years. And the reason we have lost so many monarchs is mostly due to habitat loss. Climate change is part of it, but uh, too many people are just eliminating milkweed from the roadsides and their gardens. And um, we need to get back to planting native plants and putting na native milkweed back in. So Monarch Sister Schools has uh, four uh, steps to their program now. One is habitat restoration in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Hands-on STEM activities with art and education to connect students with nature. We have a cultural exchange with sister schools in Mexico. And we've just started adding, adding little literacy, little libraries to our program to increase literacy. So up in the top corner here, these are just some of the gardens we've planted this year with the help of Rotary Clubs. So this picture on the upper left is actually the first school I think that was planted in DC. Um, and this is the Ann Beer School. And due to some turnover in the school and some changes, uh, the garden uh, was destroyed. So I've been talking with those teachers and they are ready to build a new monarch butterfly habitat at Ann Beer School. So if you wanna do a hands-on project, an environment project, 
that can be your first project to put a butterfly garden back into Ann Beer School right there in DC. Uh, this is a garden that the Rockville Rotary Club did. Uh, this is the Interact Club in Ellicott City. This is the Gaithersburg Rotary Club. This is the La Plata Rotary Club at St. Charles High School. Down here is uh, NAF Middle School that um, my club, Baltimore Sunset, and also Towson Town Rotary Club helped us put it together. And that's the garden a couple of months later when it started flourishing. So just to give you an idea, we planted 33 gardens this year, two out of state, one in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania with a Rotary Club and one in Denton, Texas at a retirement facility that was um, done with five Rotary Clubs. Uh, we encourage you to plant native plants and many of you know Chris Puttick. He, um, I think is the executive director at Chesapeake Natives and all they have is native plants there. So this is a list of most of the pollinator plants that can go into your garden. They're all native to the Chesapeake Bay. And we have three or four types of milkweed that we can plant here in Maryland. The most, the best uh, milkweed plant for the monarch butterfly is the common milkweed because it grows six feet tall and its leaves are very thick and fat, plenty of food for the caterpillar. And then the next favorite is the, is the butterfly milkweed, which has an orange flower. The common milkweed has a pink flower. And this only grows about two feet tall and it doesn't spread very well. The common milkweed will spread and the swamp milkweed will spread. Many of you might've heard Dr. Doug Tallamy speak at a district conference last year or the year before. And he talks about getting rid of as much grass as you can because grass is not doing anything for our ecosystem and replace it with native plants. So here you see our students going into the garden with their clipboards and their rulers and pencils and they're gonna document and measure what they see. So this is the common milkweed plant and this is the big pink softball size flower that grows on the top of it. The students measure the uh, plants, they measure the leaves, they measure the length of the caterpillars because the caterpillars change every day as they're eating their milkweed. And this plant here is the butterfly milkweed, which is about two feet tall. The life cycle of the monarch butterfly depends on milkweed. They don't eat sugar water or fruits or watermelon or anything else that you might've learned as a child from the Very Hungry Caterpillar book. Um, they only eat milkweed. So the monarch lays her eggs on the milkweed leaf and then the caterpillars emerge and that's all they do is eat milkweed until they get large enough to form the chrysalis and become another adult monarch. In the wild, only about 10%, five to 10% of the caterpillars survive because one bird's nest needs about 6,000 caterpillars just to feed its young. So we need to be planting more milkweed to save the monarchs and to save our birds. The monarchs, uh, the last generation, the fifth instar will be called the Methuselah generation because this monarch actually makes it all the way to Mexico and it doesn't reproduce anymore. It just um, travels the last distance to Mexico. So the students that raise monarchs in their classrooms for educational purposes, take the butterflies back outside and release them in the garden and say goodbye and tell them to go safely to Mexico. And many times when we're releasing these monarchs, we tag them so um, we can find out, you know, more research about where they go and how they go. Uh, and we did find out that the Western monarchs, which many go to California, and those monarchs were in deep decline down to 2%. And we just got a report that there are hundreds of thousands of monarchs in California this year. So that is very, very good news. Um, we don't know yet how many are in Mexico this year, but if we get that good of a return in Mexico that we got in, in, in uh, California, then we'll, we'll be on our way to restoring the monarch's habitat, but we're not done yet. So in the spring, all of the monarchs uh, are migra migrating north um, through uh, from the middle of Canada, all through the United States. And then the monarchs that go to Mexico do 
mate and mingle with the monarchs that go to um, California. Um, they just, some get the message to go to Texas and into Mexico and others get the message to go to California. So this is what it looks like at a monarch butterfly biosphere reserve where all the monarchs gather in the mountains um, on these oyamel fir trees. And the habitat loss that we have in Mexico is caused by illegal logging due to avocado farming, but also um, in Mexico, the, they have wooden stoves. So many of the families are just cutting down enough wood to be able to cook and feed their families. So this is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a sustainability issue that we need to deal with. And here you can see large parts of land being cleared uh, probably for the avocado farming. This is one of our schools in Mexico that we partner with. So the kids write pen pal letters back and forth from the American schools to the Mexican schools. And we do Zoom like class to class sessions. In Mexico, each of the schools has a tree nursery and all the different age groups go up into the mountains and plant the trees to restore the habitat in Mexico. Again, this is what it looks like when the monarchs hover together for warmth, when it gets cool on the OML fir trees, and when the sun comes out, they fly, and it's just a spectacular sight. William will have to tell you that because he's been there many times and is planning to go in February and take anyone who wants to go with him. So if you would like to go or you'd like to sponsor a teacher on the uh, trip to Mexico over President's Day weekend, uh, please let William or I know or put it in the chat. This is where they go, high up in the Transvolcanic Mountains, which is about 10,000 feet high. And it's about, um, it's west of Mexico City, so to just give you an idea. This orange cluster here is all the monarchs. And this is how they measure the hectospheres around the trees, how many monarchs are going each year. We have a curriculum that we use that was written by the monarch expert in the United States, Dr. Karen Oberhauser. And uh, we have a curriculum which is K to two, it's now three to five, third to fifth grade, and then middle school. And we use the middle school curriculum also for the high school students because it is uh, uh, strong enough, deep enough, you know, the content is very good. And these are a few of the teachers and William from one of our teacher monarch workshops. And Louise, Hay, um, uh, plant, Louise Hill planted uh, a monarch butterfly garden in the DC area, and she is still our expert teacher to train the teachers. Here you see William again in the background there with a group that he took to Mexico. They go to El Rosario each February, and the trip lasts either four days to one week, depending on how long the people can stay. In Rotary, all across the globe, we've got people working on pollinators and now districts are signing Operation Pollination Pollinator Pledges. So if our district wants to do that or your club wants to do that or you wanna do that as an individual, please let us know. This is Marlene Gargulak and Judy Freund. They're both in Wisconsin. And we even have a park ranger that's a Rotarian that is speaking out to Rotary Clubs and also to all the different national heritage areas to plant more um, native plants. And Chris sent me this picture. He said, if we don't save our pollinators, this is what our supermarkets are going to begin to look like. So if we want our supermarkets to stay full of fresh fruits and vegetables, we need to have food security and national security, and we need to plant native plants that will attract our local pollinators. So let me remind you that we do habitat restoration, hands-on STEM learning to connect students with nature, uh, literacy with our little uh, libraries, and we do a cultural exchange. And now if you'll open your phones or click on Instagram on your computer, and like us, I would really appreciate that. And I wanna show you a quick Instagram photo, uh, video, it's like two minutes long that you can see from the first um, uh, Monarch 
garden where we placed a little library. So let me turn my volume on and you'll be able to see this if you go to our Instagram page. So I'll stop sharing now and answer questions. Hi, I, I found that incredibly fascinating. I appreciate you very much for coming on. I actually attended Ann Beers Elementary School 60 years ago. So Wonderful. This will, me, this will give me a great opportunity to go back, see the changes at the school and participate in the program. I just want to thank you very much for, for being a part of this. So somebody asked a question in the chat about how many schools in Mexico are involved. I believe we have six schools in Mexico right now and we are growing. Sure. And William, if you wanna talk about the corridor initiative a little bit. Yes, you can. Uh, I'll do that. Uh, and this ties in very much with this seventh focus area of Rotary International, the environment. Um, we are working with Rotarians, actually the most prominent uh, Mexican Rotarian, his name is Ernesto Benitez, uh, Chris, Adik knows him. As a matter of fact, Chris has plans to go down to Mexico in uh, the very beginning of February. Um, but uh, in addition to the Monarch Sister Schools program, we now have a quarter initiative that we're doing in partnership with the Mexican Rotarians. And what is that all about? Well, um, the Monarchs have this incredible migration. They migrate from Southern Canada through the United States, all the way down to central Mexico. The place that I take a group to almost every year, didn't do it last year for some reason, um, is just two hours or so west of Mexico City. So it's easy to get to. So uh, the annual trip consists of a couple of days in Mexico City. And then we have a, a Mercedes uh, Sprinter bus that takes us out there. And we visit one of the sanctuaries uh, where the monarchs gather by the millions. And it's truly an awesome sight to behold. And uh, as Marianne said, they gather at an altitude of about 10,000 feet uh, in these volcanic mountains. Uh, it's, and all you can hear are the butterfly wings. Uh, plus, you have them uh, kind of going over your head, landing on your head, landing on your shoulders. Uh, it's a total immersion into nature. Um, so, but in the program actually started in Mexico. Um, we, I had heard about the problem of the illegal logging of the forest. There are two distinct habitats. There's the breeding habitat, which is in Canada and the US where the monarchs um, rely on the milkweed um, for reproduction. But being a tropical butterfly, they migrate 2,500 to 3,000 miles uh, back to the same groves of trees where their great grandparents were the year before. It's really remarkable their navigating skills. Um, scientists have been trying to figure out how they do it. The, the latest um, theory is that they navigate relative to the sun. They only travel during the daytime and they know the position of the sun. It's always the same time of year and they follow, follow a certain pathway. What is the purpose of the uh, corridor initiative? Uh, right now we're focused on Mexico, but it actually starts with the Operation Pollination people that Marianne was referring to in Wisconsin. That's kind of the north end of the corridor. It roughly follows I-35 south to Texas. We're doing the part in Mexico with our Mexican Rotarian friends. 
And what are the objectives? They are to restore the overnighting places. They stop, they need trees where they can overnight. They need water like us humans and they need food. So uh, planting pollinator gardens with native wildflowers is uh, the food part. So that's just a quick uh, overview. So this is something that I've done as a volunteer, uh, even though I'm executive director of this organization. And I, I really wanted Marianne to, you know, share with you the program uh, that many Rotary clubs are involved with. And uh, perhaps our club, uh, starting with Sterling, can uh, go with me and we can do our own project at Ann Beers. Um, the projects are relatively inexpensive. So, uh, you know, the funding part is kind of the least of our worries. It's, um, and the garden serves as a great way of connecting the kids at the schools, who these days are usually more absorbed with their devices, uh, to connect them with nature. And uh, it couldn't be a more beautiful creature than the monarch butterfly to do that with. And uh, the fact that they actually raise the larvae, which become the butterflies, and then release them, and then are actually able to speak with the kids down in Mexico where they go. So it's um, been a great program, and we hope uh, to continue to do more with uh, Rotarians in the US and Mexico. Uh, I also want to thank our foundation for providing our first grant, which was like umpteen years ago <laughs> when I started, about 10 years ago. Um, and that was $2,500 that we used well. Um, and that's about it. So Marianne, uh, we have a tradition, our club. Um, normally I would be handing you a tree certificate. We plant a tree in the honor of each one of our speakers. We'll actually be able to tell you where it is, something that we do in partnership with the National Park Service. The trees are planted on the National Mall near the National, um, well, actually the Tidal Basin near the Washington Monument. And we're also planting some native trees in the downtown parks to retree them. So um, thank you. Thanks again.